Well, well, well. Well, saying that, right, there's not really that's ha much happening in the charts, man. Bitcoin always does this. It always does it. It doesn't go nowhere. We expect a little bit of movement to the upside or even to the downside. It just doesn't bloody move. <sighs> but other things have moved today. Seen some nice flavor in oil. Seen some movement in the Nasdaq and the S&P, even though they took a little while. But I'll be talking about the S&P and Nasdaq with a couple of trades that I took today. It's been a slow day for me, so I'll be diving into that. But tonight, we're going to talk about something interesting. Have we not been talking about the government's holdings of Bitcoin? And what will they do with it? Guess what? Yep. They've moved some over to Coinbase. Now, what I'm going to go with on this one, there's two things that can happen. Well, yeah, two things that can happen. All right. Coinbase is either negotiated a fee with the U.S. government to either pay for it at the going rate or a discount. Now, hopefully Coinbase is of the mindset that they would ideally want to sell it to the best amount possible. So hopefully we would encourage Bitcoin to move up and they're selling as it's moving higher. What if they actually store it? Because Coinbase does have a little bit of a problem with supply issues. I mean, they do hold around 344,000 Bitcoin, but what do you think that they could do with it? I just hope BlackRock doesn't come on the scene and is like, look, we will take that. For them to only dump it, nah, very unlikely. We've now just had $2 billion worth of Bitcoin effectively go into Coinbase. We naturally assume that they're going to be gunning for liquidity, which means they're now going to sell it off into the marketplace. Hopefully not, ladies and gentlemen. That's what we're hoping for. Or oh, X, Twitter, man, they're coming out with some wild stories right now. We've got people believing it's just going to dump right now. That's it. I'm sure, like I did before. 69,000 Bitcoin when it went all the way down to 16. And then you've got more guys coming up with that idea now saying that they're going to do exactly the same thing again, because that's what Bitcoin will do. We are in a different time frame. And I look, I know, I know, I know. They say it's different this time, but realistically, well, principally, it is different because back then we had no ETF or hype behind the Bitcoin ETF. We had no black rock. We had no Fidelity. We had no ARK. We had nothing. We just had Grayscale that was doing everything at discount anyway. So they were making a killing off that bad boy. But look, we are in different times. But we now have the influence of Wall Street. In tonight's live, I'm going to be talking you through the story of why the yield's going up. And they're talking about it. The 10-year yield, this is important. Because the 10-year yield is going to show you the relationship of what money is actually doing. You wanted Wall Street, you got Wall Street. Now we need to understand what Wall Street is all about. When we understand why money is going to be going into, or what we would call, the $127 trillion market, that would be the bonds, then that's going to help us understand how likely Bitcoin is going to go up or how likely it's going to come back down. Okay? By the time we've done with that, that should be enough information for you all this evening. I hope you've had a good trading day. I've, the Discord today has been blowing up. People have been doing very well with trading, even though Bitcoin hasn't really done too well. Some people caught a few shorts. Some people played a few longs. I know the guys playing Euro, Gold and Oil have ripped it apart. And I'm hoping that you guys took advantage of the S&P, even though it was a bit tricky today. But we're going to be diving into that very, very shortly. So, if you are new to the channel, hit the like button, make sure you subscribe. And of course, hit the ding-a-ling, the bell, ladies and gentlemen. So you don't miss out on us going live twice a day, every single day. Well, with the exception of Friday evening. I, I, I need to kick back. I need to chill. And I already hope it's Friday today. <laughs> Anyways, who's, who's this? Uncle Tino 
following up on a morning super chat, how we apply the 23rd. I technically answered that. Mm, I'll tell you what, we're going to talk about that right now, my friend. I will talk about that very, very shortly on the trades that I took today on the S&P so that you can understand the 20, 20, 20, 40 method. I'll call it the 420 method, but some people don't like it. I don't care. It's Jesse Livermore used it. You know who Jesse Livermore is? They called him the Great Bear of Wall Street. He was short during the Wall Street crash of 1929. He was short during the Wall Street crash of 1929. What a boss. He had the banks knocking at his door saying, please stop shorting the market. And this was a guy that would sit in the bank vaults and annotate where he was likely to invest in next. He needed to visually see the money. So you can imagine a hundred million dollars back then in the 1929s. This just this dude, you know, go and Google Jesse Livermore. And if you've been listening, you'll know that I'm pulling a few of his sayings, you know, you'll understand when you get involved in it. By the way, this guy committed suicide because of his misses. Like he not because he lost like he made a hundred million, lost a hundred million, then made it back. But he lost his mind. I think the missus, like, sent him crazy, you know. So, yeah. Women, man. Women. <laughs> okay, I'm going to shut up. Let's get into this live. Here we go. So, Silk Road. <clears throat> the confiscated Bitcoin has now moved over to Coinbase. Now, why is this, why is this important? Like, what's the government going to do with two billion? They ain't going to do nothing with two billion. But it's what's going to happen to this cryptocurrency, this Bitcoin. Like I said, there's two things that could happen. Coinbase is going to pay either a discount on this or the government's going to demand the going rate. It's going to be done OTC over the counter anyway. Are we likely going to see the transaction happen? What's going to happen with this cryptocurrency that's in Coinbase? I personally think that they could actually hold on to it because of a issue with supply. But because Bitcoin's now pulling back, don't get it twisted. The retail is selling Bitcoin. Investors are selling Bitcoin. They can only sell it if someone is prepared to buy it. It just doesn't go into the market and just hope that you're just going to pull money from somewhere. People are buying the Bitcoin that's hitting the marketplace right now. The sooner we come to understand that, the better it's going to be for us when we look at articles like this and think, oh my God, it's FUD. Clearly not. It's not FUD. You might think that coming into this live, I'm promoting FUD. Uh -uh. It's awareness. These are buying opportunities. Now, the key thing is, is how long will it go down for? Well, we know Bitcoin is a bit of a volatile nut job. Speculation on this story right here is what will Coinbase do with it? They're either going to hold on to it. We don't know the clear transaction of what's going to happen with it. We just know it's gone to a wallet. All right. And it'll be stupid for them to sell it now that it's going down. Well, it all depends on the actual amount of it at the time that it was picked up, okay? So 30,175 Bitcoin is to what has been reported to the Coinbase wallet late Tuesday morning. Um, it was confirmed sale by the government in which in 2022 seized around 50,000 Bitcoin and was in March in 23 when it was unloaded for 9,861 coins, all right? So we've got a lot of Bitcoin that's floating about, or should I say, coming back into the to the chain, you know, to the supply of Bitcoin, all right? Now, look, we've got this story here. Okay, Silk Road, they've transferred the Bitcoin, okay? But let me show you something. Courtesy of Look on Chain, okay? It says, US government transferring 30,000 Bitcoin. Like, this is, this is cool. You see the transactions right here. You see the addresses, you see the wallets and what have you. And it's a Coinbase Prime Deposit wallet. Happy days. That's there. Okay. Then we go into this. The ETF. Right. Now, this this look on chain, I don't know if it's an individual or not. It updates on the story of what's going on with the ETF itself. Okay. And keep on seeing that Grayscale, March 29th, they decrease their holdings. 
and then they haven't updated it, okay? And it says nine ETFs, including Grayscale, added 1,352 Bitcoin. That was done on the 1st of April. And of course, we are on the 2nd right now. And this is what you're going to get with Wall Street, ladies and gentlemen. It's so important you understand that because Wall Street will always have this frequency of putting money in, taking money out, putting money in, taking money out. And we are about to go into what could appear to be the next thing that's going to start putting investors to start moving money away from the markets, all right? The Fed rate cuts looks like it ain't going to be happening anytime soon, okay? Today's data, the jobs job openings came out and showed that, yep, there's 8.7 million people in work. Well, I'm not too interested in that reading itself. I'm more, import more important on, should I say, I'm paying more attention to the ADP employment change and, of course, the non-farm payrolls that are coming out later on this week, on Friday. Remember, non-farm payrolls will always come out on the first Friday of every new month. That's a big trigger. And on top of that, you've got the unemployment rate coming out as well, which they're projecting for 3.9%. Okay? If that comes in lower, <laughs> say chow chow to your Fed rate cuts and say hello to the yield. Why the yield? Well, listen, stick with me on this one. And if you guys are of the impression, or should I say, would you be in agreement with me that Bitcoin is a commodity? Please put in the comment section at the end of this, because I know there's going to be people watching this afterwards. Mad love and respect. But let me know, is Bitcoin a commodity? We have a supply of Bitcoin. Now, we don't know the true supply of oil. We don't know the true supply of gold. That's why there's companies that do exploration, refining of the gold, and they're always out to try and find more gold, okay? We could get a nice big find somewhere in, I don't know, wherever in the world. That's naturally going to then, of course, increase the supply that's available for us in gold. But Bitcoin has a fixed supply. I'm of the impression Bitcoin is a commodity. And what we want to see happening is in times of concern, we want investors to start treating Bitcoin because Wall Street's here. And this is what I think's going on. I think that investors are trying to probe the idea that Bitcoin can be treated as a commodity. Thus, when things are going bad, Bitcoin will then start getting the interest from commodity traders. Bitcoin should be going up. Oil going up. Gold all-time high going up. When you see commodities moving up, the stock market's still at its highs, okay? Something is changing. Word on the street says, ladies and gentlemen, that the government, or should I say Wall Street, is sweating a 5% yield again. We're back to the yield, back thanks to oil surge. Why does oil surge pose as a problem for us? Check this out. This is the S&P. Today, for the platinum members of the group, we've had a good day today in terms of euro setups. We projected euro to mark up to the coming to the recovery of the gap and the red vector candle. Quickly go into that just to put things into perspective for you to deliver my point. Go to euro, go to the one hour time frame, and you can see right there, they actually swept that and completely ripped the target to the upside. Let me just put this over here, get rid of that, happy days. So we completed our projection with that bad boy right there. Happy days. The next one, um, gold. There she is. I mean, I've got a price target for gold, but man, gold today came and delivered the flavor. Look at this. Gold. Whee! Straight on the target, ladies and gentlemen. Happy days. They moved really well for us. Now, these areas here, look how tricky it can be when you're trading all-time highs. Banks are loading up on gold, or actually, equity hedge investors are selling their gold right now, okay? Because things are starting to change. Investors are starting to get a little bit concerned about things, which leads me over to this. Oil. Oil today, pulling out some interesting flavor. We projected that oil was going to come back down into the recovery of the vectors and then bounce from this point to go back into the same zone. We go over to oil and we can see oil did just that. What a beautiful thing. Happy days. Came down. You should take be, be taking profits. Makes the recovery back up. And we should see oil still making a move higher. But $85 a barrel. Problem. Problem, oil, 
is trending upwards and it's all happening under our noses. This is going to hurt inflation. This is going to make people say, hold on a second. Yeah, we might have an un a low unemployment rate in principle. OK, that could mean that people are working two jobs just to sustain what's going on in the United States. What are the cost of eggs right now in the US? What's the cost of a chicken? Your milk. I'll speak to Mike and his, like, his kid drinks a lot of milk and he's buying it by the gallon. Like, you know, it's everybody's kids drinking milk. But when you're paying like, I think, it, how much was it? Six, seven dollars or something for a gallon? Man, it's hard being in the UK because now I'm starting to use the metric system in the US. You know, I'm walking into shops and I'm like, um, can I order a gallon of milk, please? And they're like, what? I'm like, sorry, man, that's, 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 that's just me. Like, my people are American, man. We'll go to America then. Don't worry, I will be turning up very, very soon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to do a Traders Reality meetup, you know, and we'll touch down in Florida first, you know. We've got to do that one. So, yeah, if you're down for the meetup, say hoorah. <laughs> More importantly, <clears throat> when oil starts to rise, this does hurt the stock market, which explains why everything has been going down in the stock market. Investors are effectively starting to now turn to oil because when the economy doesn't look like it's going too good, they're going to come to oil. This is what happened in the subprime mortgage crisis of 2007, 2009, 2008, sorry. Oil started to make a move up. Then in September, I'm sat at the pool and I'm listening to Sky News declare that the US is now saying there's a bit of a problem with the subprime mortgages. And then before you know it, oil clears that $149 per barrel and then slump. They hedge themselves. The hedge is happening right now, ladies and gentlemen. When oil starts to roll over, that's when we get our Fed cut, in my opinion. Go over to the yields. How is this going to help us with Bitcoin? Well, just bear with me a second. The 10-year yield right now is at 4.35%. The two-year yield itself is now at 4.6%. Still got a yield inversion and the stock market is making all-time highs. Wow. Okay. If the yields go up, that means they are going to be encouraging foreign investors to invest in the U.S. government. OK. That means that the stock market is going to be hurt by this. The yields going up is a problem because no one is getting involved in the U.S. government bonds. So what the U.S. government does is it advertises lucrative rates to encourage people to come and transact and buy the bonds. Now, we're not just talking about domestic and commercial players. We're talking about foreign domestic and commercial players. Those are the guys who are going to come in and save the day and start picking up dollars. Dollar goes up. Bitcoin, in principle, goes down. But if investors start using Bitcoin as a commodity, then we should be seeing Bitcoin climbing up. Gold. And they pair it to the idea of Bitcoin as well. And they call Bitcoin digital gold. In principle, Bitcoin should be continuing its move to the upside. Gold is making all-time highs, ladies and gentlemen. And word on the street is $3,000 per ounce of gold. Wow. That's something that can happen. All I'm saying to you guys is to go check out silver, man. Silver. We're in that AI boom madness right now. They need gold and they need silver. Silver's going to start coming up. I'm telling you. All, all, all commodities, wheat, palladium, aluminium, not aluminum. I'll be coming to the States and I will be saying, I'll, I'll walk around with a microphone. I'll say, please read this word. Okay. And it will say aluminium. And then I will ask them, why are you saying aluminum? We're parking that now. We're parking it. It's aluminium. Okay? Don't get me started on it. I've got an association. There is an association out there, all right, that says it's aluminium. Aluminum. Where's the O, bro? Anyways. It's not your fault anyway. Uh, it's not your fault. It's all good. It's not It's not your fault, Liz. <laughs> you guys are funny. Anyways. <clears throat> So if these yields keep on going up and oil's price goes up, gold keeps on going up, but Bitcoin 
stalling. Something that I want to convey to you all right now, okay? Before everyone starts losing their mind, like, here, look, you, you've got, yep, Bitcoin halving in 17 days and what have you. But there was an article, wait a second, there was a post that people are putting up um, about Bitcoin where it's like, this is the resistance, that's it now, we're going down, we're going down, we're going down. Listen, if, if Bitcoin's going to go down, Bitcoin's going to go down, but people are going to be seeing it as the wrong thing. Only a few people would anticipate the fact that Bitcoin going down is a bad thing, but a good thing in essence, because look what we have got, ladies and gentlemen, and I said it today, this candle needs to turn into a vector. It has to turn into a red vector candle. Look at what we've got. We have got our first vector candle, red vector candle, second red vector candle that we've had. No, third vector candle, fourth vector candle on the daily. To oh, shut up. All right, so we've had a very good, interesting red vector candle right here, okay? The idea is that if this candle has been planted in the chart to sustain the idea of bids coming into play, then the idea is that we would want to see Bitcoin move away from this point. But word is that Bitcoin's probably going to be ranging. So maybe even though oil's going up, gold's going up, and yields are moving up, Bitcoin going sideways, but granted, Bitcoin and its volatility usually means it's going to start coming back down again. Like I said, I'm interested in Bitcoin unless it breaks the 60,753, then we will have a different conversation. But if it isn't happening yet, and I haven't got a reason to believe it getting close to that point just yet, there's no reason for me to think otherwise. Why? Because that's predicting. I need to act on what I see. Here is an example of what I mean by that to help you guys understand. Today, the S&P itself, very, very interesting day in the market. Now, what did I do today? I, it was a slow day for me in the marketplace, to be frank with you, ladies and gentlemen. So I was expecting today the S&P to start moving up. OK, so as it stands right now, still on our funded accounts, we got nine. In, I've got nine accounts that I'm trading at the same time right now. And so far, the performance accounts were in $128,000 profit. And today we managed to make, today was a bit of a slow day. We only cleared $4,490, okay? And the trades that I took today on these accounts, the entry point, so this one right here, you can see, <clears throat> got $1,484 on this trade right here. You know what? Let's just bring this up. I will bring, make that easier for us. Here we go. So this trade right here, right? I'm, you know, I, I only traded a few, con two contracts on each account today and I scaled in to make it four. I didn't really put no size today because I just didn't trust the market. Wasn't trusting it at all today, right? But what I was witnessing is at this, on this position here, we took a long at the 5,239 price point, okay? So where was that? Well, that was right here, ladies and gentlemen, inside of this range. Why did I take the long inside of here? Okay, well, you've got to understand how the S&P and the NASDAQ move. Okay, so watching the tick chart and watching the order flow, I was witnessing that the offers, remember what I said in today's live stream? Okay, if you watch today's live stream, I had stated that I'm trying to build longs on the S&P because the offers were coming in and they were showing an imbalance of around two and a half thousand offers. So at some point, the guys that were bidding price lower were effectively going to mark price up to attack those offers. All right, because the idea is when you open a trade or you buy, you're hypothetically going to be placing a stop or an exit point, which is where the offers get filled. Okay. Okay. So this is where my entry was on that position at 2000, um, sorry, 5,239. Now we managed, I wanted to see price go up towards the 5,259 and I closed it off. I closed it off a little bit too soon. I closed it off at the exit price of five, up, yeah, 5,257. And that was the average on each of those positions. Okay. Now the reason why I'm not too impressed with it is because today, if you look, they had made the move up, they had come back down, and then they shifted all the way up. And this happened at 8 o'clock UK time, all right? They spent all this time today just sat inside of this range, which was pretty frustrating. But my entry point initially was at this point right here, inside of this range, okay? 
This to me was the candlestick that was going to start it. But on the tick chart, or should I say on the depth of market, that is where I saw about 700 offers coming in, or should I say buys, 700 buys plant themselves in the book. Now that's not a normal order. On average, the S&P moves roughly around, or should I say a contract size, is roughly around anything between 50 all the way up to around 300, okay? Anything above that, that's where I start paying attention. And I saw someone planted an order at that point, which effectively created the volatility for the green vector candle, okay? You see this green vector? Wasn't the same. This vector candle down here? Not the same. This candlestick right here came in with that 700 order. Okay, that was a clue for me. Okay, start playing the game. So I loaded up positions. I wanted to see price come all the way back up to eat those offers. And eventually they did. But I got out. I got out. I didn't want to ride the move all the way to the upside. I just got frustrated with the way she was moving today. And plus, we've also got the idea of news announcements that are coming out, especially the ADP non-farm employment change. That's going to be a bit of a problem in terms of trading tomorrow because it's news announcements happening at quarter past one, three o'clock and then 5 p.m. We got Powell speaking, okay? So the idea is that hopefully that if they do like what Powell has to say, then this whole move to the downside has been engineered to bring price all the way back up. Could that be the same for our dearly beloved Bitcoin? What a clown. Why is he going down? Oh, goodness. Right, let me just have a look at these super chats to answer the question for the gentleman. Sorry I've taken so long, my bro. He says, Uncle Tino. Thank you, my bro. I'm following up the morning super chat on how we apply the 2020-2040 method on leverage trades, okay? Let's, hold on, let's see what he says. Let's say at 30 to 50x leverage, mainly, how do we take the entries? Could you walk us through an example on the charts? Okay, then. First things first. Marcus, my guy, oil. Marcus, we got a guy in the platinum section who rips oil apart. He actually cultivates, he actually mines oil. And when I say mines it, this guy cleans up oil. He trades oil and oil, I'm going to give you this, ladies and gentlemen. Oil will always respect the vectors. Always. It always does. Marcus, tell him your testament because that's all you trade. OK, it always respects the vector candles. And those of you that are new passing through to this live stream, you're saying, what's this guy talking about vectors? What do you mean by vectors? Well, the first thing you need to do is go to the Traders Reality website and take this free course. Yes, it's a free course. OK, we do have paid courses, but I strongly recommend you take this free course. It'll explain everything. You have to become a bronze member so you can get access to all this information. One hour to understand all of this system. The system is free to download. Just go to the info tab at the top and it will walk you through how to get hold of the hybrid system. It's a free indicator and you come and watch this course and you'll be able to understand the terms and the, the terminology, should I say, on how to use it. You've got PDFs in there, all sorts. It's a happy place to be. Now, the gentleman asks the question on how can we apply the 40 20, the 420 method when it comes to leverage trading at 30 50 X? Frankly, my friend, scrap the idea of 30 50 X if you're going to try and use the 420 method. Scrap it. You want to be using lower leverage, all right? Fundamentally, the 40 20, the 420 method is for, okay, and I'm going to explain it to you now. The 420 method is fundamentally for the holders, okay? The idea is you've got $10,000. You split that $10,000 into three percentages. So 20, 20, 20, that's two, four, six. So you've got $6,000 of working capital, okay? And you've also got $4,000 behind you, right? That's capital for safety, just in case, right? The idea is that as a spot trader or holder of Bitcoin that wants to load up and pick up more Bitcoin, he isn't going to be worrying about leverage or getting shaken out. He's relying solely on Bitcoin's price. Now, the 420 method is ways on how you can capitalize on DCA Bitcoin at specific points based on the hybrid system. But when it comes to leverage, don't do it, bro. Seriously. If you do decide to use leverage, your 320 percent, you drop those down to five. 
now you've got quite a few opportunities to trade. That means you are only using 5% of your capital, okay? So just be very mindful. When you're using leverage, you will not have the freedom and flexibility to allow the 420 method to really come into action. Let me explain. So imagine you are a spot trader. You've got $10,000. You now want to load up into Bitcoin inside of this area. Why? Because you believe Bitcoin's going to move back up at some point this week. Okay? You got your 10K. Now you should put now your 20% right here. So you've gone 20% inside of this zone on Bitcoin. That is a terrible thing right there. So 20% sits right here. Okay? Happy days. So you've taken two grand from your initial 10,000, right? That's 20%. What happens with Bitcoin? It then decides to roll over and comes lower. No problem. You then say, you know what? I think it's going to hold out at this price point. You go over to the daily time frame and you then say to yourself, you know what? I think it's going to hold at the 50 EMA. I think I'm going to load up another 20% right here. Okay? Now remember, You've got 20 right there. You've got 20 coming into play, hopefully, at this point right here. You've also got another 20% working capital, and you've also got 40% behind you sitting in cash, okay? So you play the game and you wait. Hypothetically, Bitcoin comes down to this point. You've now loaded up in this area. You've got 40% of your capital in the chart at a critical point, which will be the proof that Bitcoin is going to bounce from the moving average because investors use moving averages. In my opinion, moving, av moving averages are laggard but they do give you the psychology of what someone is likely to do there. That means we could see offers or bids coming into play. Look at how many people have been buying Bitcoin. People think it's been sold off. Yeah, by the weak hands. Look at how many people have been buying Bitcoin. We see it from a different light right now, don't we? Someone placed an order of 2.7 million to buy Bitcoin at that price point. 25 million came in. Whoa, what does that mean? That means the same players over here Here and here over here, if you can see just below my head, you go back in the live streams last week, we were talking about these points and we were saying that if Bitcoin were to go down to that point, we would logically want to see those guys step in again at these points. Bitcoin is being picked up for a discount right now, okay? That's why you're seeing so much movement to the downside because they're buying, they're not selling it yet. It's not being sold. It's only being sold by the people who are prepared to buy it. The selling happens when price goes up. Because if you've got a profitable position, what do you do with it? You sell it at the highest possible price. You don't sell it at the lowest possible price. You don't go to an antiques place and say, right, I'm going to pick this antique up. I'm going to pay $10,000 and I'm going to sell it for $2,000 because I'm that dude. Nah, man, you don't do that. You go to another auction and you say to them, right, asking price, 10K, okay? And you're waiting, it gets listed off. All right, $1,000 bids, happy days. Bid one, bid two, bid three, bid four, cattle, you know, all that story. And then when it gets to your asking price, your asking price, ask, offer, 10K, bids at 1,000, offered out at 10. That's the, what the guy at the auction wanted, sold. To the man with the flurry hat, whatever they say in that film. High concentration of bids have come into this play. So going back into Bitcoin's price, if we assume they go down low and you've loaded up 20% there, you've got 40% of your capital exposed. You still got another 20%. So hypothetically, Bitcoin were to move back up, comes back down again. You can now use the his history of the relationship of bids and offers at this point and say, okay, if it can hold this point, happy days to the upside. It's going to recover the vector candle at some point. Awesome. I'll load up another 20%. Now I'm in for 20%. I've got all my capital inside. Now, as a leverage trader, you would not be able to absorb the move to the downside because Bitcoin can slump to the downside and that's you out with your 50x. Ciao, ciao. Good night. Taxi. There's no point in utilizing it or the 420 method if you're using too much leverage. No chance. A little bit of leverage will serve you, okay? But not to the point where you're using 50x, where you are going to have to load up on your margin just to protect your position. Don't do that. It will put you in a tricky situation. Because think about it. You've got 40% of the capital behind you left for you to load up. 
and you start going in 40% of your capital on leverage, bro, like what's your margin going to be, man? You ain't use, you're not going to be using the full 40% of capital. You're going to have to take 20% or 50% of it and then put the rest in March. No chance. It's too tricky. You can utilize the 420 method in trading, but you, in principle, on smaller time frames and assets like Bitcoin, you're going to have to be very, very patient with it. All right. Here is an example of how I would approach it. So let's just go back to the idea of my of me on my entries over here with the S&P. I had an entry point of 5,239, okay? Started off with two contracts. Loaded up again at uh, 5,243. Then loaded up another contract, 5,245. Then loaded up another contract, 5,249. And then loaded up again at 5,000, um, yeah, 5,256, okay? Out of those three, one, two, three, four, five trades, $900 on the, $950 on the first trade at 239. And then each one, the loss was at the... 5,249. But you've got five positions right there. And if we were to logically take the idea of the 20% of the balance, so if I only wanted, how many positions did I put in there? Two, four, six, seven. So just as a working example, seven positions. If I went in my mind and said that I'm only going to utilize seven contracts today, whatever the percentage is on your account, I'm going to start off with two. So let's assume that's going to be your 20%. Two contracts, done, I'm in. What does it net me? Okay, cool, I've managed to get myself some movement. I'll add again at um, 5,243. Cool, I load up 10%. So now I've got 30% of my balance or contract sizes. I'm in, it moves in my favor. Load up another 10%. I had another contract at um, 5,245. Do the same again, 5,249. So as it's going up in my favor, I keep on planting. I've got most of my working capital in the trade, okay? But there, that's all in profit. I haven't got to worry about slapping on size. If you put your 40% when you've got all these positions down below, okay, that are in profit, in other words, hypothetically, imagine if you went and loaded up 20% here, okay? You loaded 20% here. Come on, man. And you loaded 20% here, right? You entered again and again and again. Then you said to yourself, wow, green vector candle. I'm going for it. You then put 40% because you're a dude with the big, big, yeah, you get what I'm saying. Look what happens there. The 40% of the capital is a bigger position. You're losing more money. You're eating into the profits straight away, okay? And that's, of course, with leverage. So if you are going to use high leverage, your 420 method in principle needs to be dropped even further lower. That means 5% or even 2.5% with leverage, okay? I really do recommend that you don't do it with high leverage. You'll get burnt out unless you are a top player of hedging, okay? So, yeah, just be very careful with that, my friend. I hope that makes sense. Um, yeah, sorry, guys. Listen, um, I haven't really been... I haven't paid you guys any attention, man. I'm so sorry. What's going on? That explains why I haven't paid you guys any attention, man. 464 likes. Come on, man. That's the only thing that's free. I ain't, I ain't begging. No. If you like tonight's flavor, please do like the live stream and subscribe. That's free as well. And hit the bell. That's free as well. So Free, funny word, man. Funny word. Other questions, ladies and gentlemen. Other questions? <clears throat> what is that? Wow. Okay. Does that answer your question, um, Uncle? Uncle Tino? Does that answer your question? I'm just looking at the... Do, really, do people really play with so many X leverage? Listen, leverage like leverage is, if you like to get slapped about, then leverage is for you, okay? But you can utilize leverage to your strengths. And I, I strongly recommend anyone that's going to trade on leverage, you trade Ethereum straight up. Not Bitcoin. Bitcoin is really for the guys that are the spot traders, in my opinion. 
You can trade Bitcoin on leverage. Don't get it twisted. Some guys are actually killing it on Bitcoin right now using 100x. That's fine. But Bitcoin is very temperamental, okay? Sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down. Then it pulls this dirty move like it did earlier on today. Took a nosedive to the downside. And if you were in it, you were in it. If you weren't, never mind, okay? But other assets like the euro, the NASDAQ, the S&P, there are certain things that they respect in the charts, okay? When I say respect, there is a balance between the bids and the offers. Bitcoin is too popular, okay? And it is a case of, right, have I caught it at this point? You can trade Bitcoin from a charting point of view, but with Bitcoin, there's too much happening behind the scenes with Bitcoin that can flip Bitcoin. That's why I don't trade Bitcoin futures, as in on the CME. It's very lightly traded. The spread is $5. No, thank you. You're automatically at a loss when you load in, even at one contract. <laughs> You're negative already, and you've got to climb up five ticks. No, thanks. No, thank you. Um, Tino, how long will it take to learn to trade like you? And do you have a step-by-step -step guide, from what I understand, using a company that provides big funds for experienced traders to trade? Yeah, so that's that's what I'm doing. I'm, use, I'm doing this trading on the funded programs because apparently funded programs are very difficult to pass and even extract money from. So it's it's just me trying to show you that it can be done, Okay. We were doing all right with that so far, so good, ladies and gentlemen. You know, we've in the month of the start of the 7th of March, going all the way nearly to a month later, we're at $128,000 profit across these performance accounts right here. And I've got actively got withdrawals coming into play right now. So these balances are going to come down because I'm pulling money out of here, which will naturally bring everything lower. But as it stands, with no withdrawals right now, we're averaging averaging on a day is about $6,000. Average trade gross P&L, $480. Our profit factor so far for the month is 2.36. Uh, average winning trades gross after fees and, well, before fees and whatnot, $1,500. Average losing trade is minus $800. The largest winning trade is nine, well, ten thousand dollars, and the largest losing trade is four thousand, four and a half thousand dollars. Okay, so the, the you will never, and this is me being straight with you all. Okay, you will never trade like me. You will never trade like anyone else because you are not them. But it's all about how good you are. At sticking to a criteria. That's on you, not me. You know? I understand the hybrid system. I created the hybrid system. I've sat and done the hours. I've stared at the charts. When everyone was out fucking, I was out doing that to the charts. That's That, that was my commitment, okay? And I've stared at, it, at charts for a long, long time to the point where you're putting tablets and laptops all around the house so you don't miss a move. And that's not even trading either. That's watching. Because in my head, I'm looking at the chart saying, it's going to go from this point to there. Am I going to prove a point to myself right now? And all day I'm looking to prove a point, prove a point. You can backtest, but if you don't know what to look for when you're backtesting, you ain't going to know how to see it in the future. Do we predict price? No, we base it on probabilities. How likely is it going to go from one point to the next? And if you use the right amount of risk, you're going to be able to sit through the deviations, or as we all like to say in poker, the variance of price going against you, okay? We are the ones that mess it up. It wasn't always easy for me, ladies and gentlemen. This is a hard game to play. Trust me, it's difficult. And it's more, the trading is easy, straight up. Trading is easy. You have to buy and you have to sell. That's easy. But it's the when. It's the how long for. It's should I do it now or should I wait or should I not do this? What does that say? What does this say? Do I understand the macros? Do I understand this? What's the relationship of money in Wall Street right now? Why is oil going up? Why is Bitcoin gone down? Why is gold moving up? Why is dollar gone down? I need to go long on euro. That would justify me taking a long to trade back into the red vector candle recovery. I'm having that conversation in my mind. Why are the bids coming into play on the S&P and not going lower? Looks like we've got absorption. Looks like they could actually mark it up because there's about two and a half thousand offers on the depth of market telling me that they want to sell. Cool. Price should be going up. 
I'm having that conversation in my mind continuously. So to simply say there's a guide, right? The guide is having an awareness of what moves markets, okay? It's aggressive buyers and aggressive sellers, simple as, okay? And it's finding that repetition of when are they likely to do it? Imagine you've got like the S&P today when it moved from the lows, all of that compression at the lows of bids, buying, 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 passive people buying up, buying up, the presence of green and blue vector candles at the lows for it to only explode up, okay? Those are things you look for. Just going into the chart and looking for that and then going over in your mind and saying, look, how likely is it going to go here? Am I going to see that over and over again? I just did something on... I did something for the guys in the platinum tier, the weekly review, okay? And it talks about climatic candles. They gave them that lesson on the way, on the Saturday and they've all been ripping it apart today just on the climatic candles. That's just one way of trading by just waiting for a specific candlestick to appear by the hybrid system, okay? Just one candlestick, but understanding the narrative around it as well, what's going on behind the scene. You'll never know what's going on behind the scenes, but understanding what's going on in the market. Why is price dropped? Then all of a sudden, it's not moving. They're doing more of something, but not following through with it. They're probably going to do the opposite. If they're making you believe it's going down and it's not, it's probably going to go back up. That's not in a book. You'll never get a step-by-step -step guide with that. Yeah, I've got courses on the hybrid system. I've got a scalping course. I've got the exo charts course. I've got all of that. There's only two courses. One of them's free, okay? They give you the structure. How well you apply the structure, that's a different story. But all I can say to you guys is if you're going to pick something on the hybrid system, run with it, whether it's the first green vector candle above the 50 EMA or climatic candles or deviations back to the 50 EMA or away from the moving averages. OK, stopping volume candles, the psychological levels, OK, the red candle, green candle formation. There are many strategies within the hybrid system. Why? Because there is always going to be a different way that they move price, but they repeat it over and over again. You've got to try and find the one way, look for it in the chart and then prepare yourself to try and trade it in the future. There's no foolproof way to trade, ladies and gentlemen. None. None whatsoever. And 90% of trading, in my opinion, is you. It's you. Like I've said this before, and I'll leave you on this note. I will give you a 100% win rate system, okay? I'll give it to you, and I'll give it to your friend. You will come back to it and say, Tino, I made a 100% return on my account. Awesome system. Thank you very much. Your friend will say, hold on a sec, bro. I've got the same system, but I lost. How? How? How you lose him, bro? It's a 100% win rate. How did you lose? And again, it's where we mess it up. The brain, man, this thing right here, it's a pain in the ass. Be sure to like and subscribe, ladies and gentlemen. I'll be checking in with you tomorrow. Mad love. Peace.